It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Lawrence Prince, who is the Drew Professor of the Humanities at Johns Hopkins University in the Department of History of Science and Technology in the Department of Chemistry. He has PhDs in Organic Chemistry and History of Science. His research <coughs> focus is on the late medieval and early modern periods and he is particularly interested in the historical interactions of science and religion as well, teaching classes on that subject and uh, receiving awards. Um, actually, a, a significant award I, I ought to mention is, is the Francis Bacon Medal for Significant Contributions to the History of Science, which he was the, I think I was the first recipient of. And he has made a, um, a, 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 a DVD um, a 12 lecture series on science and religion as well. So. Man of many parts, and we're interested in your second talk. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you again for the introduction. Right. Well, in, in this talk, I'm set to speak about uh, natural theology, that is, giving it a historical perspective. I'll also um, uh, try to be a little bit philosophical uh, about, uh, the, about natural theology and what it can and can't do. So let me uh, show you the three parts of this lecture. Um, First, a historical overview. I am a historian, um, and so getting the facts right about history seems to me to be the first thing that we need to do. So I'll look at the origins and the developments of natural theology and its purposes. Uh, then I'll do a bit of a philosophical consideration. I confess I am not a philosopher, so bear with any naivete that you find in what I say. Um, the strengths and the weaknesses of natural theology as it is generally defined. And then finally, I'm going to try to challenge the usual definition of natural theology and try to expand it a little bit more, because what we usually call natural theology is a geographically and intellectually quite rigidly bounded, even chronologically quite rigidly bounded system. So I'm going to try and expound that a little bit more. All right. So, let me begin with the historical overview. So, definitions. Aristotle says we always have to begin with definitions, and Aristotle is usually right. Um, so, natural theology is defined as the drawing of inferences and proofs regarding God from the natural world. So, very simple. Drawing of inferences and proofs regarding God from the natural world. Now, the general concept of doing this dates back to antiquity before the origins of Christianity. Um, but usually, when we talk about natural theology as a specific thing, we are, we are referring to quite a specific practice that arose only at the end of the 17th century. Now, as for its lifespan, natural theology, as it's generally defined by historians, showed a great deal of resiliency. It was popular throughout, down to the 19th century, and continues to exist in modified forms to this day. Um, largely through extensions of one of its main manifestations, that is, the argument from design. Um, now, uh, geographically, the origin and use of natural theology is centered in England, and indeed it has always been especially prominent in the English-speaking world. Now, that's not to say that it was absent on the continent, but in fact, historically speaking, the vast majority of works in natural theology were written in Anglophonic countries, so in Britain and America. Um, accordingly, a natural theology, is usually so-called, appears almost exclusively in Protestant contexts. Now, at present, and I'd love to be shown wrong about this, I would like to have a counterexample, I am not aware of any Catholic works that fit into the uh, natural theology category as it's customarily defined. That's going to be part of number three. I'm going to try to expand that a little bit more. Um, so, let's look at natural theology's origins and evolution. Uh, oh, right. Look at that for a moment. I've forgotten what I've put in here in my PowerPoint, which is what I usually do. Right. The foundational text in the genre is generally considered to be the work of this man, that's John Ray. Now, Ray was born in 1627, same year as Robert Boyle. They knew each other quite well. He studied, in fact, here at Cambridge, became particularly interested in plants, uh, and proposed some early classification systems for plants, parts of which are still in use. 
1667, he became an FRS, that is a fellow of the Royal Society of London, the oldest uh, scientific society in continuous operation, and Ray also published uh, prodigiously. In 1660, he was ordained an Anglican priest. So as such, he's another example of a long line of people in holy orders uh, who were also involved in the study of the natural world. Again, as I said in my last lecture, this is an important point to keep making because we so re often uh, come across in common parlance and common uh, publications in the modern world the idea that these two worlds don't overlap. Well, in 1691, um, he published this book, The Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of Creation. It proved extremely popular. It was reprinted frequently for over 50 years. And his work, this book, is based on the conviction that, and I will quote now from Ray, there is, for a free man, no occupation more worthy and delightful than to contemplate the beauteous works of nature and to honor the infinite wisdom and goodness of God. What Ray's book does is to present material gained from the most recent studies of his time in the fields of botany, anatomy, astronomy, physiology, and so forth, because in his view, all of these studies proclaim the wisdom and goodness of God. Again, the study of the natural world, it's a kind of worship. The next important uh, step in the development of natural theology, this is another one of Ray's books. Um, you can see some of the things he was involved in doing, talking about the primitive chaos, the origin of the, of the world, of uh, the general deluge, um, and so beginning, middle, and end of, of the world. And you see what he talks about, mountains of stones, of fossils, that is, sea fishes, bones, and shells found in the earth, and so forth, volcanoes and earthquakes. That's 1693. All right. Um, Boyle lectures. I mentioned uh, Boyle in my previous lecture. Now, when Boyle died, he was still a very rich man even though he'd spent so much of his money on um, uh, experiments. Nonetheless, uh, without any heirs, since I say he never married or had children, um, he left uh, a considerable estate at his death in 1691. Part of this was to be used to found a series of lectures, which were named after him. Uh, what he did is he owned several properties in London. And these properties, the rents from them, were to be paid to a committee composed of uh, a bishop and the Royal Society of London, the president of the Royal Society of London, and they were to organize an annual lecture in defense of Christianity. Now, Boyle, being an Irenic type, absolutely forbade in his will that there be any arguments up that involve things between Christian denominations. That was absolutely forbidden. So no apologetics on behalf of Anglicans or Calvinists or Catholics or anything else, just Christianity in general. Um, he said that it would re that the lecturers should restrict themselves to the promotion of Christianity towards the non-Christians and atheists. We'll come back and talk about atheists in a moment. Well, the first lecture that was chosen was this man, Richard Bentley, a classicist, was very important in his time. Um, the first lectures were given in 1692, 1693. There were six of them, three each year that Bentley delivered. Now, Bentley took aim against atheism, and in doing so, he picked on the most modern scientific ideas of the day. In fact, we still possess the correspondence that went on between Bentley and Sir Isaac Newton, where Bentley was trying to get Newton's most recent ideas and work them into the Boyle lectures. And Newton did, in fact, provide a considerable proportion of the material that Bentley used in 1692 and 1693. Bentley's lectures set a tone that the Boyle lectures would carry largely to this day. Now, in fact, the Boyle lectures were suspended in the 19th century. I don't know what, for what reason something happened with the rents, perhaps. But they have been reinitiated, and the Boyle lectures now go on again every year in London. Um, the following lecturer, um, spoke on the identity of Christ as Messiah, uh, which perhaps may have been more in line with Boyle's intent. 
but his work uh, proved not only anomalous, but also quickly forgotten. Nobody remembers who the second Boyle lecturer was. Most of the Boyle lecturers, after Bentley, took Bentley's lead and used scientific ideas of the day to promote uh, Christianity or just simply religious beliefs, that's theistic belief. Um, the best known Boyle lectures were always those that dealt with natural theology, in particular natural, natural theology against atheism. A very popular series were given in 1711 and 1712 by William Durham. And these were collected and revised and reprinted for much of the 18th century. Durham, in fact, called his project Physico-Theology. That, in other words, by looking at the physical world, we are doing theology as well. Well, this popularity of the Boyle lectures, and in fact the reason that Boyle, uh, the fact that Boyle founded them in the first place, must provoke one question. Who are all these atheists, and why are there so many of them running around England at the end of the 17th century? Well, the answer is surprising. There probably weren't any. Historians have sought in vain, largely, to identify late 17th and early 18th century atheists. Find one, point it out. Um, I must say that you know, this may be an inappropriate comment, but it, it, it's somewhat like the former administration in my country looking for terrorists behind every bush and rock. Mm -hmm. um, they're out there somewhere. You know, find one. Um, the, the, the name of Thomas Hobbes often comes up as a candidate. And he was often seen as an atheist at the time. The Earl of Rochester, perhaps, is another. Nevertheless, from the time of the Restoration in 1660, there was in England an increasing atheist panic. Um, and as I said offhandedly a moment ago, it resembles any number of other panics. We can compare it almost to red scares in the U.S. and in England that have happened in the 20th century. A similar sort of, just fe more things are feared more in the dark than they are seen in the light of day. What thinkers of the period seemed to fear was not a, so much a philosophically based atheism, but rather a kind of vague, unthinking, functional atheism of rakes and wits and persons of loose morality. And it's this kind of panic that the Boyle lectures and natural theology as a whole strive to address. Now, one might argue, in fact, this argument has been made, and there's some reason behind it, that the vigor of the response through natural theology is what actually crystallized the type of atheist and gave it a solid form. That is, in a sense, you're, you're fighting against something very vague and undefined, and in doing so, you sort of define what it is. So inadvertently, you, it's a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. You create the atheists by talking about them and saying they're such a big problem. Now, although early natural theology attempted to draw all kinds of inferences about God from the natural world, by the early 18th century, natural theology was predominantly directed merely towards demonstrating the existence of a deity. And it is that function that characterizes it pretty much thereafter. Oh, I forgot to show you. There's a, um, the first of the Boyle Lectures, <coughs> uh, 1692, uh, preached there in St. Martin in the Fields, which is where they were published, which is where they were preached for many, many years. And you see he's entitled it here the folly of atheism, and what is now called deism. Uh, remember that the word atheist, around the time that Bentley is writing, has a much broader meaning. If you're an anti-Trinitarian, you could be called an atheist. Okay, so atheism covers much, much more than simply the denial of, di of divinity. Okay. Right. It was later, a century later, in 1802, that there appeared the most famous example of the genre, and that is William Paley's natural theology. Let's see if I have a picture of that. Oop, well, I guess I don't. Okay. Um, Paley was himself an Anglican vicar and a writer of textbooks, largely on moral philosophy. Now, in fact, there's not much that's original in Paley's natural theology, and that's not intended to be an insult to uh, Reverend Paley. He didn't intend it to be original. Remember, he's a textbook writer. 
what he does is he summarizes much of the natural theology that had developed over the previous century. And the book that he wrote, Natural Theology, was a regular part of university curricula. In fact, we even have the testimony of a young Charles Darwin of having read the book and having been very impressed by it, read it at school. Now, finally, probably the most extensive work on natural theology appeared in the 1830s. And these were the Bridgewater Treatises, which was an eight-volume set funded by a bequest from the eighth Earl of Bridgewater. He left the sum of 8,000 pounds to commission and print works, quote, on the power, wisdom, and goodness of God as manifested in the creation. The authors for these uh, eight volumes were chosen by a committee made up of the president of the Royal Society of London, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Bishop of London. And the series contained works on astronomy, anatomy, chemistry, geology, and several other fields. Um, so curiously, um, in 1839, Charles Babbage, who apparently felt left out, uh, on his own accord, contributed a ninth Brid Bridgewater treatise, which contains the, his description of his famous calculating machine. Um, now, the hundreds, literally hundreds of works on natural theology that appeared from the time of Ray down to the 19th century um, were written by a variety of authors, sometimes natural philosophers, sometimes clergymen, sometimes both. John Ray's activities in particular were very evenly divided between natural philosophy and divinity, and he held credentials in both fields. Um, uh, People like Durham and Paley were clergymen, so they gathered scientific material from uh, scientific writings. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, one non-English example was a fellow by the name of uh, Bernard uh, Neuventeit, a Dutch mathematician and doctor of medicine. And in the 1710s, he wrote one of the few uh, notable non-British works on natural theology. Although it's interesting that even though it was originally written in Dutch and then translated into French and then translated into English, it has many, many more editions in English published in, in London than anywhere else. So, what's the main thrust of all this authorial activity? Some argued that the attributes of God could be drawn from the natural world, but most of it was just to demonstrate God's existence. This is, again, the atheist question. This goal is already clear in Ray's book. Now let me read you a quotation out of Ray's book, and I'll apologize in advance. This is 17th century English. There seems to have been a shortage of periods in 17th century English, just lots and lots of commas and semicolons, so it's a long <laughs> sentence. Actually, this is not even the entire sentence. It's only the first half of it. All right. Take a deep breath. There is no greater at least no more palpable and convincing argument of the existence of a deity than the admirable art and wisdom that discovers itself in the make and constitution, the order and disposition, the ends and uses of all the parts and members of this stately fabric of heaven and earth. For if, in the works of art, as for example, a curious edifice or machine, counsel, design, and direction to an end, appearing in the whole frame and in all the several pieces of it do necessarily infer the being and operation of some intelligent architect or engineer. End quote. So, here's a fine example of how most natural theology rests on one principle, that is the argument from design. The argument from design holds that the smooth functioning and intricate contrivance of natural objects implies a designer, that is, it provides a proof for the existence of God. Classic example is the story of the watch. It's told by William Paley in 1802, although he was, again, it was not original to him, he collected it out of Neuventeit. And Neuventeit himself drew upon ideas that were collected, connected, excuse me, connected to the mechanical philosophy of the 17th century, which in turn is connected to even earlier things, but we won't go back that far. The story goes like this. Suppose you're walking around in some isolated spot. Paley says you're walking around on a moor somewhere. And you see a watch lying on the ground. You pick it up, you look at it. You notice that the gears are beautifully cut, that they fit together exactly right, the best possible materials are used for its construction and its component parts. And you wonder, where did it come from? From the watch, you naturally infer that there is a watchmaker. And even if there's nobody in sight, you look around and you don't see anyone, 
you assume that there's some hidden watchmaker beneath the horizon that you haven't encountered yet. He's out there somewhere because you have the watch in your hand. So then the argument moves from the artificial to the natural, which is one of his problems. Now consider, instead of a watch, consider the eye. See how beautifully it is put together, how ingenious it is in its adaptation of parts and its materials. Therefore, in looking at the eye, you are sure of the existence of an eye designer, which we conclude to be God. Or, well, what did people in the 18th century make of this argument? Well, in fact, the argument from design was subject to criticism, very fervent criticism, by the middle of the 18th century, and not just, or even predominantly, from those inclined to atheism. The argument, in fact, as many people I, now, like Paley, I'm not saying anything original, um, the argument turns out to be weak, ambiguous, and from the perspective of Christianity, actually quite dangerous. Um, several thinkers, David Hume among them, pointed out that arguments from design might not take you where you want to go. A watch might tell you that there's a master watchmaker, but it can just as easily imply a workshop of watchmakers. In other words, polytheism. Or it could point to an apprentice watchmaker, something akin to Plato's demiurge. And even if we do get to monotheism, the god of natural theology is far from the Christian god, one who has no moral force, a unique eternity, or a personal concern. In fact, the deists, who by the middle of the 18th century are those who believe in a god, but one is who is impersonal and detached, latched on to natural theology as much as did Anglican vicars to show that Christian revelation was unnecessary. Hey, they said, we don't, we're not interested, we don't need the scripture, we don't need Christian revelation, just look at the world, it tells you there's a God, and that's all you need to know. So faith, revelation, church become unnecessary. When pressed too forcefully, the argument from design actually encourages non-Christian views of God. And it does so by overemphasizing arguments that are drawn from reason for his mere existence at the expense of faith in the revelation of his attributes. Can you see the difference? From a Christian perspective, re merely demonstrating that God, that a God, exists is actually a rather cheap commodity, in fact. Right? So there's a designer God. Big deal. He could be a God who is totally unaware that he has created you. Completely unconcerned. He doesn't, can't even care about you. It could be a Neoplatonist strictly a Platonist kind of God. But that's totally antithetical to the basic Christian principle that God is Father. So there's a danger to this argument. So that's the problem at the end point. But the mechanism is no better, because the argument's held together by analogy. Watch, eye, nat artificial, natural. So that analogical reasoning is only as valid as the analogical links are sound. So a watch implies an intelligent watchmaker, okay. That's not a problem. We know where watches come from and how watches are made. Um, but when that is transferred to the eye, we have a problem. It assumes that eyes, natural things, are produced like artificial things, watches. Now, this analogy, historically, is a legacy of the mechanical philosophy that saw the whole world as a functioning machine, as a cosmos that was like a clockwork, one of, not, not like a clock that you have up there on the wall, but like one of these great clocks. If you've ever been to the cathedral in Strasbourg, they have a huge uh, uh, astronomical clock with dozens of dials there. Was, the original one was 17th century, the one that's there now is later. But you wind it up, right? the person goes in and winds it up, moves the weights around, and it runs for a week, and all kinds of things happen. Things move on the dials, figures come out and do a little dance, a rooster crows up at the top, and um, all kinds of things happen, like one of these very complicated Swiss clocks. Um, and uh, that was the model, the clock, this complicated clock, was the model for the 17th century's view of the world. It's interesting, I'm gonna take a little diversion for a moment. Um, it's interesting, as time passes, how we change what our model of the world will be. Is it something organic? Is it like a tree? Is it like an organism? Or is it like a clock? Or now, is it like a computer? 
And we tend to, there, there, there's this tendency in um, human thought to try and make these kind of analogies. And we were talking in our last lecture about how we have various mental constructs that help us interpret things. We like to pick on patterns of how we can explain the world's functioning. So if we think about the way the mind works, in fact, all of you, if I asked you, tell me how the mind works, you would probably, without even thinking about it, start drawing on images drawn from computer technology. But this changes constantly. So the natural, the, the, the natural theology was drawing on a vision of the world of the 17th century, of the world's a great mechanism. Now the problem is that natural things arise spontaneously as completed units from seeds and eggs and such like, and they reproduce themselves. Artificial things are composites that have to be put together. You make each piece and you put it together. Now, um, I have a watch, drawer full of watches at home, and I have never yet opened it to find little watches inside that they have somehow <laughs> reproduced and, uh, and uh, produced little watches, which might be a nice idea. I wish that would happen with my money drawer, actually, but <laughs> that's never happened either. Um, the second assumption, then, is that God, the maker of natural things, works like a human being, the maker of artificial things. Besides being unlikely, this is a sort of dangerous anthropomorphism. Um, it threatens to make God's activity rather banal. He works like a mechanic. He's an auto mechanic who sort of puts the world together piece by piece, and it robs him of a certain level of transcendence. Of course, the thing that we all know is that the design can be in the eye of the beholder. We cannot tell what we perceive as design, whether that's something real or our construct of it. The problem is we can't take a designed universe over here and an undesigned one and say, okay, are they the same or different? Right? We've only got one of them to play with, except for multiverses. But, right? um, there's no valid control, no valid yardstick by which to do, measure degrees of design. Another way of saying this is to point out that the argument from design rests upon an argument for design. So you have to argue the first one before you can get to the second one. And without uh, an ability to do a comparison, we, we can't do that. All right. Um, now, let me get to my conclusion for this part. Arguments for design often rely upon appeals to ignorance. We cannot imagine how an intricate system could come to be without an intelligent designer. And so, so such arguments lead to what has been called the God of the Gaps, where God is very helpful to fill in all those little spots that we can't explain at the given moment. We don't currently have a way to explain how something happened, so we resort to God as an explanation. Finally, the arguments for and from design are not really, in fact, rational arguments. They appeal to our emotions, to our feelings of awe and wonder, rather than to our reason. The world, obviously, is an extraordinary place full of marvels. The more science we learn, the more we see that that is true. But you can't turn that kind of our admiration into an argument. So while design arguments are great for exhortation in a devotional context, they're not very good at all in a probatory sense. Now, why am I making a big deal about this? I'm making a big deal about it because it highlights a crucial historical development that I mentioned a few moments ago, a shift in what natural theology was asked to do. Natural theology originally, when Gray was doing it, when his predecessors were doing it, was about heightening devotion in believers. And so it was something intensely personal. But this function was progressively displaced in favor of, a, of its use as an apologetic to convince non-believers. That's where the weakness lies, in this historical shift that took place sometime around the time of Bentley, at the end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century. A believer studying the marvelous in intricacies of the natural world can see the hand of God and have his devotion increase. Okay. But a non-believer subject to the same awe and wonder, is not going to translate that emotional response into praise of a creator. Instead, he could just as easily marvel at the efficiency and power of natural forces. In short, your sense of wonder is likely, I think, 
to enhance your respect for whatever cause you already have in mind, not change its identity. All right. Again, I'm a historian. Natural theology's development stems largely from circumstances that are peculiar to 18th century England. First, the reliance and the development of these makes sense only in the context of a paranoia about atheism. There are those atheists out there, they will undermine the state, and therefore they have to be refuted. Um, second, there was specifically in England pressure to turn to reason to prove religious ideas because of the political situation. The English Civil War of the mid-17th century left a legacy of religious dissension and sectarianism, especially by loath church enthusiasts, <coughs> namely the people who relied on personal experiences of faith and revelation and who opposed the Church of England. One solution for this, then, is to turn to a reason-based argument for theological principle rather than faith or Bible-based arguments with the assumption that reason is common to all people. Well, I do know some counterexamples to that, but um, <laughs> uh, never mind. Uh, and thus, something that even sectarians can agree on. Members of the Royal Society, for example, as they were being found, as they founded themselves in the 1660s, uh, believed that experimental natural philosophy was something that people of differing religious affiliations could agree upon. In fact, the Royal Society of London is remarkable, simply be, partly simply because of its latitudinarian aspects. It actually had members who were, yes, Church of England, but leftover enthusiasts from uh, the Interregnum, and even Roman Catholics. Um, so, with the social and political need to restore order and unity in Britain, the alliance of natural philosophy and religious apologetic was a natural solution. And now we can begin to see why natural theology flourished in Britain, but not on the continent and never in Catholic countries. And third, many people have pointed out that there is um, a relationship between the, well, the idea of a well-ordered world governed by a beneficent sovereign and the projected image of the English crown after the Restoration, that the two are intended to be that Charles II coming back as the powerful uh, restorer of order in England after 15 years of civil war. There is an overlap between his role as the center of the state and the role of God in organizing a unified and well-ordered cosmos. Uh, moreover, just as an aside, I must say that um, the idea of a universally beneficent deity is a great deal easier to swallow in a very pleasant place like in Cambridge, um, than if you are, let's say, um, trying to cultivate a small plot of land in sub-Saharan Africa. You might not think about God being quite as beneficent and good in, as, as you would sitting here looking out on the lawns. Um, now, I would argue that the popularity of natural theology in the English-speaking world was, in the end, quite self-defeating for its proponents. By the start of the 19th century, natural theology had become an entrenched part of the culture and the first and actually virtually only line of defense for theism. Not that theism actually needed a defense at the time. This is the sort of funny irony going on down to the beginning of the 19th century. Again, who were these, who were these atheists? Um, certainly easier to find some at the end of the 18th century than at the end of the 17th, but still, it's not a large portion of the population. Uh, the reliance upon natural theology, then, and its inseparability from a design argument set the stage, I would argue, for a much more contentious reception for Darwin later in the century than was necessary. Because the advocacy of natural selection as the shepherd of morphological accommodation, what looks like design, in biological systems immediately and naturally undercuts the foundation of the design argument and consequently of the natural theology as it developed historically. So, thus, Darwinian evolution and natural selection oops, um, oh, there we are. Um, Darwinian evolution and natural selection acquired a tang of atheism 
which it need not have done, simply because, let me say this again, by cutting out the design argument, by undercutting the design argument, undercut natural theology, and natural theology had become a, a fundamental <coughs> bulwark against atheism. Whereas historically, had things occurred in a different way, had natural theology not acquired this central uh, role in religious apologetic, then Darwin's reception would have been different. I'm not trying to do hypothetical history, but I'm just trying to show connections that are going on here. Um, and this connection again explains the fact that Darwin's reception on the continent, especially in Catholic countries where natural theology never took hold, was extremely different and noticeably less contentious. There the question was about the problems of materialism and, uh, and polygeny, not about atheism at all. So now, let me move to my third and final section of my presentation. I've given you a description and historical overview of natural theology as it's usually understood and presented. But I've come to think in the last couple of years that perhaps this is really doing a disservice, that it's too narrow a view of natural theology, that it unconsciously recapitulates a fairly prevalent, I think I can say it's a pre fairly prevalent Anglo-centric focus that's generally present in the history of science, quite widely. Um, if we go back before the time of Paley, Durham, and Bentley, before the time in which natural theology became a primary weapon against atheism, we can uncover some practices which can well be called natural theology, but, are which, uh, but which are of a very different sort. If natural theology is defined more broadly as simply the use of the natural world to say something about God, his nature, and activity, then we can uncover a much broader and more geographically, chronologically, and confessionally comprehensive sort of natural theology. All right. Of course, let me set down a limit. We can't, we, we, this is a problem that happens whenever we try to broaden the definition. To broaden the definition of natural theology to include all readings of theological meaning from the natural world would stretch the term beyond its breaking point. It would make it meaningless. It would not describe anything anymore. Such religious readings of nature are virtually ubiquitous. We could cite Cicero's De Natura Deorum and a number of passages from St. Basil, St. Augustine, the other patristics, or in fact all the characters I mentioned in my previous lecture. But I want to do something a little bit more specific. I'd like to propose that there exists another sort of natural theology in the early modern period, and one that might prove quite instructive when compared to the better known sort of natural theology. Um, the natural theology of the 18th century is already a product, I would argue, of what we might call the modern age. In this case, by modern age, I'm going to define that very specifically, as a time in which science and religion had begun to separate into separate spheres of activity pursued by separate individuals. Writers of natural theology gathered their materials out of scientific circles, like Bentley writing to Newton for advice, and deployed it in a religious one. That is, it's, it's largely a process of transplantation, and as I've said, for an increasingly narrow purpose, that is, proving the existence of God. But there are 17th century forms of natural theology where the religious and scientific remain a more of a seamless garment. Some of this is very clear in John Ray, um, perhaps reasonably enough, since he was simultaneously an active natural philosopher and an Anglican priest, but also in Boyle's obvious sense of devotion and in the context of his experimentalism. But let me introduce two other figures that exemplify worldviews um, in which um, a natural theology of sorts is fully implicit rather than explicitly pursued as it would be in the 18th century as a comparison. So uh, here is a man by the name of Robert Flood, who lived earlier, so late 16th, early 17th century, uh, doctor of medicine in London, member of the Royal College of Physicians, a friend of Harvey, for example, a man who seems to have been uh, involved in uh, discussions with many of the great minds. He and Kepler had an argument, he and Gassendi, he and Nassen, uh, and so forth. Now, here is an image from his book, 
Utriusque Cosmi Historia, that is the history of the two worlds. Uh, this image is called the mirror of uh, the whole of nature and an image of art. And what it does is it shows an incredibly connected world where the divine and the mundane are closely, closely linked together. Now, in our modern world, we are not used to looking at images like this and drawing meaning out of them. This is what art historians do for us. They help us to identify things iconographically. So let me help you understand what it is we're actually looking at here. Because what this image makes is a very powerful statement about man and God and the natural world. All right. So what we have is we'll work from the, we'll work from the top down and then back up again. At the top here, there is this numinous cloud with the sacred tetragrammaton, the unutterable, unutterable name of God written on it. Out of that comes a hand that holds a chain, chained to this female figure, who represents nature, the natural world. That is to say that nature has an independent existence, but is always tied to the way God decided to create, the way he chose to create the natural world. Nature then holds a chain tied to an ape. The ape of nature in the, in the early 17th century has a very specific meaning. It means human artifice. Because in artifice and technology, what do we try to do? We try and ape nature. We imitate nature. We imitate the natural world. Okay. So, God the creator, the natural world, and human activity within the world are all tightly linked. Now let's go back up the chain. The ape sits on this globe. And if you look at the height of the ape, he defines a circle. And in this circle are four little circles. And working our way out, in the middle, first of all, is what Flood considers to be the fundamental scientific endeavor, which I'm happy to say is chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> Because what is chemistry good for? As he writes it here, it is for correcting nature in the mineral world. So we get all kinds of minerals that have to be purified, they have to be made into other substances. Chemistry does that for us. In the next circle, I'm sorry this is so small, but it, it's, it's a huge thing by itself. So it's, uh, I'm sorry, I, maybe, I, maybe I have a larger, a larger one. Of oh, I do, good. Yeah. Um, right, so here he's got distillations going on. The next one says, art helping nature in the vegetable realm. And here we have the grafting of trees, we have agriculture over here. So if nature left to its own devices, uh, if, we, if we tried to be hunter-gatherers, we'd all starve to death. So instead we graft fruit trees and we have agriculture that improves the natural world. Then improving the animal kingdom. So over here we have medicine, we have the artificial incubation of eggs hot sand, and so forth, and silkworm culture. And then finally, the more liberal arts. He's making a little dig at the universities here. The more liberaliores, the more liberal arts, they're all the mathematical arts. He doesn't care very much about the non-mathematical arts. So geometry, perspective, painting, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, cosmography, time, motion, and so forth. What are we seeing here? This is now the same kind of thing that I talked about with Hugh of St. Victor 600 years, 500 years later. <laughs> that human activity improves the natural world. As the world is as we find it, it's not good enough. We have to work on it and improve it. Again, now, beyond the realm of human artifice in nature's realm, we find the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms. So here we have various metals assigned here with their symbols, uh, various plants, and then various animals, with man over here, woman over here. Okay? And you'll notice he draws these little lines. Here are the planet Venus. Okay, I'm sorry, I should have said. Here are all the spheres of the planets and the fixed stars. Here the planet Venus is connected to Orpiment and copper, the metal, Saturn combined with uh, two other minerals. For Flood, the world's a world of connection. 
that there are constantly connections between different parts of the world, that he's trying to figure out what they are. For example, here, a uh, woman is connected with the moon because women uh, imitate the cycle of the moon every 28 days. So there's a natural connection between women and the moon and man and the sun. Uh, in, in medicine at the time, men were considered hot, dry, and women cold, wet. So just like the sun is hot, dry, moon, cold, wet, there's a connection there as well. So what Flood is trying to do, we go back to the bigger image, is show how the whole world is connected. Now not only is it connected with itself, but it is connected with its creator. Back, back up the chain from artifice, art imitates nature, art, nature follows the will of God. That means that, in fact, if you're busy as a human being down here, whether it's with the liberal arts or with improving the animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdom, you are, in a sense, saying something that's connected to nature and connected to God, the creator. This is a very different kind of natural theology. It's a very different kind. It's not about trying to prove the existence of a deity out there somewhere. It's about trying to find God in the world that having signs everywhere in the world that remind you constantly of his presence. Let me give you, it's a connected world. Mundane and divine are one unit. They are not separate. Another person I want to talk about, the last person I want to talk about is, see, there he is, one of the most interesting characters of the 17th century, Athanasius Kircher, a Jesuit. Um, and you know, look at, this, look at this picture for a moment. This is, a, this, is a, this is sort of a picture of a smug man. Let me tell you about the things he's <laughs> saying to you, right? Come see my museum. He had a huge museum of uh, antiquities and artificial uh, machinery and natural objects in Rome. And basically today, just like if you, go to, if you go to London, you go see the British Museum, or you're considered a barbarian, if you went to Rome while Kircher was there from about 1650 to 1680, in your little Baedeker of the time, go see Kircher's museum. And he would lead you through the museum. And the museum was intended to be an image of the world. Uh, everything in it uh, represented in one way or another. Kircher did all kinds of things. He attempted to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics. Got kind of close. Not quite. Um, he was a center for a worldwide network of Jesuits. This is something extremely important that I just touched on last time. I want to say a little bit more about it right now. Think about Jesuits. They get sent to this day all over the world. The provincial general says, go, and they get on a ship and they go. So by the time of Kirchherr, the Jesuits had been in China for a hundred years. They had been in India. They were in North America. They were in South America. One of my favorite things, to tell you a little story. I was looking through a journal from the early 18th century. It was a, a, a journal of um, scientific works uh, published in France about 1710. And it would this journal published letters that people would write in, observations they have made or calculations they had done. And there was this wonderful little letter about the science of infinitesimals and mathematical infinitesimals that was signed, so-and-so, Jesuit, missionary to Illinois. And you think about some Jesuit in 1710 in the Midwest of the United States, you know, like living in a wigwam, doing infinitesimal calculus, and then writing this back to Europe to be published in one of the journals. It's a remark it gives us a very different view of what Jesuit missionaries were doing out there in the world. Kircher was a nexus of Jesuit correspondence. And so people sent him observations of eclipses, of the declination of the magnetic compass, of ethnographic everything um, back to him. And so in effect, the Jesuits were able to create the first worldwide scientific correspondence <coughs> network. Uh, and it all went back to Rome, and Kircher was the person who put it together. All right. <coughs> Again, notice what they're trying to do. They're trying to study the whole world and catalog it and put it together into a whole. This is something about early modern science that I really need to stress to you, that it's about putting things together. 
it's about synthesizing, it's about seeing the individuals but putting the individuals into a whole. Not just, like, say, putting different examples of spider crabs together into one group, but to connect the spider crabs to other crabs, and then to other crustaceans, and then to other sea life, and then to other life, and then to the whole planet, and then to other planets, and finally to God. It's this a constant idea of putting things together into a cosmos. Right. Now, Kircher has some very interesting ideas, actually. Um, he published uh, a thick tome entitled On the Magnet, or Of the Magnetical Art. And the motto that he gives his book uh, here, Arcanus Nodis Negantur Mundus, the world is bound with hidden knots. Again, this idea that everything is connected. And what's the, what's the natural philosopher supposed to do? He's supposed to find what's not obvious on the surface by getting together, getting all these different pieces together and seeing how they're connected. Now, um, what you see here is that, uh, let's look at this, this, is another, this, is the, this is another edition of it. Um, this is the Ro first Roman edition. Uh, it turns out, just as an aside, while you contemplate this frontispiece, remember early moderns were extremely visual people and extremely metaphorical. We look at this thing, and it, I, I've seen my students do this, and I've seen my colleagues do this. They flip past the, the illustrations to get to the text, to read the text, because somehow the truth is in the text. Right? Early modern people had a different view, that somehow seeing is knowing, that somehow the sense of sight instantly gives us knowledge in a different way from reading. So these kind of images, they're not decorations. They cost a fortune. They cost more than the book to print, because you have to get an engraver to make them. So just on that grounds, you were actually able to buy Kircher's books about the engravings, and they cost you know, one-tenth of the price. Um, right, so look at that for a moment while I, while I say what I've now forgotten I was going to tell you about. Um, oh, yes. The Jesuits were particularly interested in magnetism. Have you ever played the trick, maybe you did this in school, where you take a magnet, you put a piece of paper on it, you put iron filings over it, and you see the lines of magnetic force? That methodology was discovered by Niccolo Cabello, a Jesuit that lived uh, about 20 years before Kierkegaard. Jesuits were really interested in this. Why were they interested in this? Why did they go towards this? Because the, why were they so interested in magnetism? Because it's an invisible force. We don't understand how it works. We can't see it. Oh, it's like God's power and God's existence. We can't see that either. We can only see it in the effects. And so in a sense, studying magnetism, studying that which is invisible in the physical world, says something about studying what's invisible in the larger, in the spiritual world. Now look what Kierkegaard does here. All right. Let's analyze this. Around the outside are all different fields of intellectual endeavor. Here's medicine, theology, of course, at the top, philosophy, physics, poetry, um, rhetoric, uh, cosmography, mechanics, perspectives, astronomy, music, uh, geography, arithmetic, natural magic, which maybe we should talk about, I don't have time to talk about today, but notice they're all chained together. Remember, everything rests quietly connected by hidden knots, or the whole world is connected by hidden knots. All these forms of knowledge are connected together. They are also connected to these three spheres. What are those three spheres? The sidereal world, that is everything above the moon, everything that's further away from us than the moon, so the realm of of the astronomer. The sublunary world, everything on this side of the moon, so everything, all kinds of life, everything that goes on on the earth. And then the microcosmic world. What's the microcosmic world? That's human beings. That's human beings. Because we are images of the greater world, the macrocosm. So, physical world above the moon, physical world below the moon, mankind itself. Again, linked 
together by chains. But then what's this in the middle? Notice that it is equally tangent at all three positions. It is the mundus archetypus, the archetypal world. It's the mind of God that contains within itself the archetypes of everything that can be. The blueprints by which things are created. The total sum of possibilities of everything that can exist. And all these three worlds touch on it. You can see the triangle of the Trinity and the all-seeing eye there. These three worlds are all touched, chained to each other and touching it, as is all the kinds of knowledge. Now, can I make this a little bit more explicit in what, what does this really mean in terms of the text? We've looked at the frontispiece now, we should get these ideas. Go to the text and read it. What does Kierkegaard do? He starts, every one of Kierkegaard's books is big. Oh, he just loved just being encyclopedic and writing down everything he could possibly find on his subject. So he goes through all the books of people back to antiquity who talked about magnetism. And he puts together all of their observations, right back from Aristotle, from St. Augustine, from Petrus Peregrinus, down to Niccolo Cabello, and Kircher's own observations. So an exhaustive description of the magnet. Then he goes outward, and he looks at other objects that display a similar magnetic effect on other bodies. So the way the sunflower follows the sun across the sky, which he calls a kind of magnetism. Um, sympathetic vibrations, where if you pluck one string, the string an octave higher starts to vibrate. There's some invisible connection between them. Then he moves higher about the sympathy and antipathy between certain plants and animals. Certain plants won't grow next to each other. They kill each other, so they're antipathic. Some harmonize with each other. With all the interest in organic gardening nowadays, we're rediscovering some of these things. You know, plant marigolds next to your tomatoes. Don't put onions next to potatoes, and so forth. Right? And you know, there are scientific reasons for this that he, of course, did not know, but the observation, the observation was there moves on to the motion of the planets around the sun, held, to the, held by an invisible force. How do they keep moving? By invisible forces. And slowly through the book, step by step, Kircher ascends from one example to another. And moderns who are not used to this will read this and say, what on earth is he doing? This makes no sense at all. He's putting all kinds of things together. But eventually his head pops out behind, beyond the Empyrean sphere, and he connects all this invisible action to one thing, to the love of God. Because it is the invisible force that binds everything together in the world. And everything else, the motion of planets in their orbits, the turning of the sunflower towards the sun, the attraction of iron to the magnet, is all a reflection, a reminder, of the love of God that permeates the universe. This is a very different kind of natural theology. Kircher would tell you, if you forget that God loves you and loves his creation, go to your refrigerator and take that clip off that holds those notes up to your refrigerator and clip it back on. How do you explain that force? That force to you should remind you of the divine love. Again, a very different, very, very different kind of, um, of natural theology. The point I'm trying to make in concluding is that for a man like Kircher, or Flood, or Kepler, for that matter, the study of the natural world naturally included, or rather entailed, theology. The two were inseparable at every level. Um, this is a kind of natural theology, I think, but it's quite different from the 18th century topic that bears that name. Um, so, let me point to the fact, uh, let me point that in fact, uh, connect, up to a fact that connects the two lectures you've heard from me today. Namely, that the early modern view of the world um, constitutes a combined view of science and religion, um, what we call science and religion in the modern day, which they would have just called natural philosophy. They would have not made this disconnect. They're about making connections. We like making disconnections. We like putting things in little boxes.
The world investigated by science or natural philosophy is God's handiwork, and the artifact reveals something about the artisan. The vast majority of early modern investigations of the physical world held this principle implicitly, even if not explicitly. And it gave meaning to a multitude, in a multitude of levels to their work and their thought, allowing for simultaneous discoveries about God and nature. Their work was at once devotional and experimental, observational and theological. And this view, with its connectivity and its multiple levels, is perhaps the most significant difference that sets the modern world, our modern world view, apart from theirs. And it's only when we really understand this perspective of theirs, of connecting things up, will we come to understand them historically. And why our particular questions that seem so important to us, if we brought one of them here, might seem odd or even quaint to them. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Larry. I wonder if I could start by uh, being controversial and putting in oh, a good so word for Paley. I mean, oh, right, yes. You see, Please because do. Stuart did take account of some of your, 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 your counter-arguments. He, he talked yes. about a watch being made from another watch and all the rest yes, of it. He did. He and did. it makes no difference to the arguments. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Yeah. Generation, if something comes about through generation, you know, as biological things do, then the same argument applies. Well. Yes. Uh, Paley certainly did uh, address that argument. I mean, the, the, the problem, of course, being that the argument had been made many, many times over, and, and, and although Paley was aware of it and tried to answer it, not to everyone's satisfaction, but that's absolutely correct. No insult to, Mr. <laughs> to Reverend Paley. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he's a bit more sophisticated, perhaps, he's given credit for. Yes, yeah, so he's dismissed in the, in the, all that often these days. No, it's a pity. Because of the, uh, yeah, Darwin's religious and all that. Yeah. Okay, um, more questions? Yeah. I have a... Uh, Two questions. It seems to me that the uh, Jesuits then were uh, in their, the assertion that everything connects. It seems to me that they would have been, uh, they would have readily accepted and been primed to have accepted Darwin's theory in the 19th century. And I was wondering how the Jesuits did actually accept Darwin's theory, which of course connects everything. The other is a little different. Um, uh, Paley aside, perhaps, um, uh, natural philosophy as it later was, as an apologetic, being in the, in the Book of Romans. Uh, it stated very explicitly that all mankind will be actually judged, actually, by uh, that, that the evidence is there for God, so that anyone should be able to ascertain that there is a God based on creation, and that we're enjoined to basically do apologetics. What's your own take, then, on the appropriateness of uh, the argument from design? Okay. Um, first question. Um, Jesuits and evolution. Um, in general, the response to Darwinian evolution in Catholic countries was extremely different. Um, it, as I said before, it was largely concerned about materialism. What do we do with the soul? Um, there were spotty bits of controversy in various places, but not as uh, as loud as it was in the Anglophonic world in the United States, and particularly the United States and Britain. Um, uh, in general, the organization of the human body out of naturally operating principles had a very, very long tradition in Catholic thought. I mean, certainly it goes back at least as far as the 12th century, um, and possibly even further, depending on how you do the interpretation. But certainly, I, I don't want to push it, people over push it, try to push it back to Augustine, which I'm very uncomfortable with doing, because Augustine had nothing like this in mind when he was writing about his work. Um, but we, we have textbooks from um, the school of Chartres, for example, uh, that talk about God's creative activity occurring only in a moment, and then natural laws just take over, that God put the natural laws in the creation. And in fact, one of them, Guillaume of Conch, goes so far as to say that all of the conditions for the emergence of human beings still exist on the earth. And so another race of humans could emerge we see that they don't, and so God must have some prohibition against races of human beings that do not descend from Adam. So it happened once, and then God has to somehow intervene to prevent life from evolving again, which is a very different, yeah. <laughs> a very different view of things. Um, so, in fact, the Catholic uh, Catholic responses were t generally much more muted. Concerns about atheism and apologetics. Um, now. 
uh, uh, argument from design. Um, I think the argument from design can work extremely well as a devotional kind of tool, right? As an apologetic, as you say. Um, it's just that if you try and grapple with it philosophically, it's not very strong. It's not a very strong argument to, to try and convince people with. What I, what I, what I sort of criticize, it's silly to criticize historical events, and I try not to do that, but um, what I'm pointing a finger at is the over-reliance on the argument from design in apologetic in the 19th century to the exclusion of all else. So that means that the problem is that when you have someone like Darwin come along and you're, that argument is pulled out from under you, the, what do you have? Yes. Uh, the pictures you showed us uh, are somehow related to alchemy, right? Um, uh, the first one is. The first one especially. Uh, could you tell us uh, what exactly was uh, the relationship between alchemy and development of early modern science? Yes. Oh, yes, good. I, uh, gee, good. You just asked me something that's the foundation of my career as a historian of science. <laughs> I hope none of you are hungry or anything. This will take another four or five hours. <laughs> um, okay, in, 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 in three minutes, let's see if I can condense my, uh, my career into that amount of time. <laughs> I, I always find it funny, you know, these little, these little flash drives. I can put everything I've ever written on one of these. It's rather <laughs> humbling. Um, all right, well, um, alchemy, first of all, the first thing you have to know is that any distinction between alchemy and chemistry is a modern artifact that dates from the 19th century. If you've heard that there's something different before that time, that's a 19th century mistake. Okay? Alchemy in the early modern period was interested in the, um, the purification and the transformation of material substances into other material substances. End of definition. Uh, what alchemy uh, did was to look at the structure of matter. So most of our ideas about the, the sub-microscopic structure of matter, so say atomism, uh, come out of alchemical investigations of this, starting in the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, and dating down to the 17th century. So uh, many uh, people of the 17th century who wanted, well, if you want to know something about the nature of matter, who do you go to? You go to the alchemists, because they're the ones that have the practical, empirical experience with it. Boyle himself, when he wants to know about how matter changes, he reads all these alchemical in the modern view, we, try, we, we have this notion that alchemy is some kind of spiritual self-transformation, which is a 19th century idea. That if, you, if, you, if we brought, as, since we have a time machine now, we're bringing people into the 17th century, brought a 17th century alchemist and you told him that, or he looked at modern popular books written on alchemy, he wouldn't recognize himself as what you talked about. This is not me. I don't want to do it. Does that answer your question? Good. Yes. <clears throat> you mentioned that um, natural theology was uh, more or less a product of the Anglo-Saxon world, and while on uh, the continent there wasn't such development. I was uh, a bit surprised because, um, from what I've heard so far, that the Catholic Church um, uh, didn't have so much of a problem, like defending like the uh, five ways of, uh, of the St. Thomas. And um, while, while the uh, Reformation uh, and Luther basically uh, rejected the, the role of reason in uh, reaching God or deriving the, the, the existence of God, which actually lasted until the uh, 20th century. Uh, uh, I'm talking about mid Europe, uh, for example, the uh, Swiss dogmatic Karl Barth, who still rejects the, re uh, the uh, role of reason, uh, or he warns. Um, that uh, the uh, the God derived from reason can be a distorted God, as you as you pointed out. While uh, Vatican uh, uh, Vatican One already uh, pointed out the uh, the uh, the ability of reason to derive the the existence of God, referring to the same uh, letter to to Paul, which uh, of Paul to the Romans, which Stephen already mentioned, uh, so, and also the uh, the critics. Uh, of uh, 
pure reason, which made, uh, which uh, was made by Kant, uh, is also derived from a Protestant context. So, can you say something about the uh, the development of uh, natural theology on the continent, or uh, or uh, or what made the uh, Anglican, the Anglo-Saxon world so different from the Protestant world on, uh, in Europe? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a very good and very important question that has to be answered historically. Um, I think, again, that the rise of natural theology in the form that we're familiar with it in the 18th century is really a response to this atheist panic that was unique in Britain following the Restoration. Um, there's some of it in Holland, but again, the interesting thing with the Nidentite, but then the interesting thing to answer again is that, yeah, Holland is also the place where there are all these radical sects of Protestantism, um, where Life is pretty good, right? If you think about what's going on economically in 17th century Holland, 17th century England, they're the two big economic powerhouses of the period. Um, so there's this constant worry that the good life is leading towards um, rakish, witty behavior, as, it's, as it was called for the, by the English, um, the t turning away from God. Um, so it's really in those two places where we find, we do, I, I, I don't know of many examples of a natural theology of this sort that's trying to argue for the existence of God um, outside of England, maybe someone can give it outside of England and Holland. There are a few, but not many. Um, certainly in Germany, where the situation is enormously complicated, um, we have people that do reject reason, Luther, you mentioned, but then Melanchthon comes along and is the intellectual that sort of brings it, puts it all back in through the back door. So it's a very complicated, very complicated issue. And I suppose in Rome, like, mm -hmm. one of the answers, um, I'm, I'm sort of, <coughs> as usual, surprised is that there's nothing about it, like the disconnect between Catholic and Protestant in the sense that it, it's amazing that philosophers like Catholic philosophers, like, say, Luke Wadding, say, didn't seem to have any influ much influence at all on, 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 on the natural theology as, as you find it, you know, because they were asking those questions almost, almost at the same time, in fact, you know. And yeah, I mean, particularly Luke Wadding, if, Again, it's really not my area, but I, I, I seem to remember it. They, they also were very, very concerned with the whole area. Is should one, should the faithful be looking for proof of God's existence at all, etc., etc., and the whole fu fun fundament of, of theology, if you like. But there doesn't seem to be any connect between that and, and, and natural theology. Is, is that right? Um, to, to some extent, again, it's complicated, but you're right. There, 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 there are these very separate spheres. Now, part of it, part of it may be. Um, I'm going to leave the door open for this, that part of what we're seeing is an artifact of what historians have looked at to date. Maybe the connections are out there and we don't know about them, um, because we've been looking, I mean, we've, we've been looking at, at one particular area rather than anything else. But for example, let me just give you an example. Um, I, I'm always surprised when I go and visit, spend time with my colleagues in Germany or in France, particularly outside the major centers, about how much stuff they're doing that I've never heard about, even in my own field. So, you know, our, we, we supposedly live in a connected world with the internet and everything, but wow, <laughs> there are local centers that are very strong um, that we don't often hear about. I mean, just the matter of sort of trading books, it could be something as trivial as the book trade. Right? So that's a historical argument. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's interesting, but I don't know what the answer to it is. Uh, to what extent do you think uh, there would be a second reason for the growth of natural theology? Um, uh, go back to Robert Boyle, one of your favorites. Um, isn't there a kind of sense of excitement on his part that he has actually discovered a concrete argument for the existence of God. He looks at the natural world and he looks at both behavior and structure and he finds that they're adapted to the nature of the niche that that particular living thing is in. Now that kind of adaptation of the structure and particularly of the behavior, the instincts of the animal and plant world um, is so uh, designed so, to so striking. So, yeah. It, that there's no other explanation for it. I mean, you have to have a designer. Yeah. Until Darwin comes along, that is an absolutely solid argument. 
Now, I think he hesitates on my right as to whether to call it scientific or to, in, in what category to place the argument, but wasn't there a sense on his part, especially on Boyle's part, uh, that here, you know, perhaps for the first time, or at least the first time in a long while, we have an actual concrete argument that can't be disputed, that there is no other explanation of why the work of intelligence is to be found in both animal, uh, uh, structure and behavior in the animal world. So uh, isn't it, that would be a factor too, wouldn't it? The enthusiasm that we find from 17th century big writers is palpable. I mean, yeah. they're clearly so excited about the things they're finding. Um, you're absolutely right about Boyle and Ray. There's this sense of discovery of, oh boy, look what I've discovered and sharing it. Absolutely true. Uh, two things to say about that, though. I see that as as the century goes on into the 18th century, there's sort of less and less of that, I'm a scientist here, look what I found, isn't this amazing? And more and more of a, all right, there's a problem in the world uh, of, of lack of faith. Here, look what the scientists are doing. Here's your proof. So the transition is from Boyle to Bentley. Yes, I think so. I think it's when, when Bentley has to go trot off to Newton to ask, what am I supposed to say? I think that there, there's some distinction. So, so what begins as a scientific discovery becomes an apologetics. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. yes. And the other thing I was going to say about that is that there's so much um, uh, dissension about what scientific discoveries actually mean. The thing I'm thinking about is the discovery of the microscopic world. So you know, so it was in the, in, the, in the middle of the 17th, end of end in the middle of the 17th century, someone puts a drop of pond water under a microscope and sees millions of these tiny little creatures that <coughs> no one ever expected existed before. There are two totally different interpretations of what that means. Either one, God is even more prolific and fertile in creation than we ever imagined, because there's all this, or there's so much stuff, it's got to be spontaneous generation. God had nothing to do with it. It's completely natural. And you know, so there's this bifurcation in how you interpret what these scientific discoveries will be. Dennis. Well, just to comment, I, I was just reflecting on your argument for the way natural theology developed as a response to the panic about atheism. And I wouldn't say, I mean, it's just interesting in the late 20th century, well, OK, back to 1960s. Personally, I thought natural theology was completely dead, okay, as a biologist. I just thought, you know, and to our great surprise, of course, <laughs> you know, here it is again, <laughs> hugely um, flourishing and uh, a huge literature on it in the late 20th century and, and right up to the present time. And I'm just reflecting on whether possibly, you know, that is also a kind of response not to a paranoia about atheism, but actually to in a very secular society, if therefore where science has a great deal of authority and is often utilized, um, you know, obviously to support secular arguments and so forth. So in that cultural atmosphere, whether that has in itself nurtured, you know, this new natural theology as a kind of response, as a kind of parallelism to what was going on, you know, in the early 18th century. I don't know if you wanted I, to that, think that, about that. Yeah, but, um, no, I think, I think that um, makes a lot of sense, actually. I was only going to talk about the anthropic principle stuff. That came straight out of the cosmology and it was before that really came straight from cosmologists and got started talk, being talked about by cosmologists um, at the beginning. And I suppose theologians came along later, but... Uh, yeah. Well, it started with Henderson, with the uh, Bible. Uh, well, you go back, yes. 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 Okay. Early 20th century, there was already a return of this kind of natural theology. Look what chemistry, the environment, then later physics, with, in the 50s, Fred Hoyle, uh, uh, nuclear physics, and then cosmology with the fine tuning. Yeah, yeah. So there was this return from from uh, basic science, from natural science. That look, we are finding some things that are at a deeper level. See, this is where the return came about. Yeah. It's like now we don't just look at you know the eye or something like this, but now we look at the deep, deeper structure of of water, of carbon, mm -hmm. and, and then particles, and then the laws of nature. And that's where it returns with, and of course now it culminates with fine-tuning and the anthropic yeah, principle. Yeah, someone like uh, Brandon Carter is an atheist, yeah. you know, and yet 
the, the whole, <laughs> he sparked this whole discussion. Fred right? Hoyle was an atheist when, he, Hoyle, when yes. he discovered his right. fine tune. Yeah, problem. absolutely, yeah. yeah quite. Well, we'll, we'll get more of that tomorrow, but uh, I guess it's 25 too. Um, maybe one last question. Um, yeah. Just, just a comment as well, just being on the <clears throat> uh, conservative evangelical side where uh, we would perceive there being a, a war, certainly with your uh, atheistic apologists really rising to ascendancy in the past uh, few decades. I think you're going to find your, uh, I think that's going to uh, figure into a, a reinvestment in uh, natural philosophy as well, I think, uh, from an apologetical perspective on our side. I personally know of a lot of authors um, who uh, write a lot of books, for example, in the States in particular, um, that dig into science to make the case for God uh, as, a, as a response to Richard Dawkins, for example, the atheists that have proceeded in the decades past. So I know that the, uh, that element now being present I think, in the discourse and that apologetic from the other side is a, is, is a catalyst among us. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed.